What's up, YouTube? Ryan here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode, I'm always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And today, we're talking about the Great Litany. Stick around. Oh, Lord, so the day of your viewing, the day of this premiere, today is now Ash Wednesday. And if you're still looking for something to do, or something, well, something to give up, a fast that you can do, or something to actively engage in, I've got a really great suggestion for you. We're going to talk about the Great Litany. And if you've been watching these videos and you enjoy what you're seeing and you want to keep coming back for good, solid, historic, biblical Christianity, then definitely hit the subscribe button, ring the notification bell, like any videos that you like, leave comments below. I love talking to you guys in the comment section. Share these videos with your friends. And if you want a little bit more of a relaxed environment, you can come back to YouTube every Friday or on Thursday evenings, you can find me at soundcloud.com forward slash Lutheran Lemonade, where we sit down at my kitchen table, we have a glass of beer, and we just talk about theology. But today, we're talking about what, uh, probably one of the greatest prayers ever written, and it's called the Litany. It comes to us from the Great Litany. It has its its history, its origin, as many things in the Christian Church in the West do, in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, very ancient, almost ha really hard to trace. I think the first, well, the, the, the real remnant for people who don't pray this litany, the real remnant of all that's left of it after all of these centuries is just the Curie. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. This is a prayer that embraces suffering and beseeches the Lord for his mercy. Really, uh, I think the litany is an exhaustive study on the Lord's prayer. If we're going to really just be honest about it, it's this beautiful prayer. Now, the original litany, the great litany, the original litany of the Roman rite had just... Oh, petition after petition after petition to the saints. St. Mary, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. This, pray for us. It, just page after page of all of these saints that beseeching them to pray for us. Luther, when he fine-tuned the litany, recognized the biblical truth that the saints in heaven do indeed pray for us. We don't need to ask them to. They're already doing it. But what is a litany? Let's. Why don't we start there? Why don't we start with what is a litany? A litany, I don't even know if it's a word used today. Um, it, it's a list. Um, I've used the phrase litany before. Oh my gosh, I've got a litany of grievances. Where should I start? Um, to the church, however, uh, a litany is a a request, a list of petitions, a, a please do this. And so we go to the Lord in prayer with this great litany, this list of requests that we have been taught, I think, from the Lord's Prayer to pray. So let me grab my good old Lutheran service book here, and let's take a look at some of this. Now this, uh, in, the, in the Lutheran service book, it's just the text. Now, if you look over, uh, you see where I have my treasure of daily prayer. There, the musical notation is this is a chanted back and forth, a call-response kind of a prayer. And it, um, if that seems maybe to my uh, Protestant viewers like something chanting in this responsive prayer back and forth, especially you'll notice some repetition in it. And of course, you're going to wag your fingers at me with that vain repetition of men. But go back to the Psalms and think on this one. Give thanks unto the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. You knew the response because as you read the psalm, that is the response. And as the people of God in ancient days would pray these psalms and pray them responsively, that was the response of the people. The stead, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. So the litany, very similar to that. There is a distinction between needful meaningful repetition and vain repetition of men. And I think the vain repetition of men has to do with what has been called in theological circles the piggy prayers, the we, we, we prayers, the we just prayers. Lord, we just this, and Heavenly Father, merciful God, we just this, and we, we just want to ask you this, and we just want to think. That's vain repetition of men. This organized, structured, ordered prayer 
of the people of God that I would encourage you, if you're looking for something to actively engage yourself in during the season of Lent, pray the litany every day for 40 days. I think that would be a beautiful thing for the church, the people of God to do. So let's start with this litany. Uh, and again, it's call and response. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, hear us. God the Father in heaven, have mercy. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy. Be gracious to us. Spare us, good Lord. Be gracious to us. Help us, good Lord. This call and response of the people beseeching our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to have mercy upon us, to be gracious to us, to hear our prayers. This, As you're going to see, this prayer is going to admit to God what he says of us, that we are poor, miserable sinners in need of his mercy. And God delights not only in hearing us beseech him for mercy, but delights in saying to our request for mercy, yes, I shall have mercy mercy upon you. Now, after this kind of familiar part, this is where the litany of prayers to the saints would come in in the old Roman rite. Luther just, they're praying for us anyways. And Luther did rewrite a lot of this from the great litany of the Roman Catholic Church. And for you, I'll have uh, the entire litany written out in in the description below, and I'm going to provide a link Uh, because I can't get away with playing too much of this litany as it's being chanted. So I'm going to share with you a link in the description below. I want you to go listen to this, see how this sounds when it's sung, when it's chanted. It's, it's, other earthly. It's, it's, it's beautiful uh, in its simplicity, but we continue from all sin from all error, from all evil, from the crafts and assaults of the devil, from sudden and evil death, from pestilence and famine, from war and bloodshed, from sedition and from rebellion, from lightning and tempest, from all calamity by fire and water, and from everlasting death, the reply, good Lord, deliver us. So this this is it. This is, this is the prayer that embraces suffering. And I think a major problem with pop culture evangelicalism, mainline American Protestantism, these televangelists on the Trinity Broadcasting Network, is they're preaching health, wealth, and prosperity, where Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. Jesus said he sends us out into the world to proclaim his gospel like sheep sheep amongst wolves. Excuse me. That was... (laughs) I didn't even know what was going to happen. That was awkward and uncomfortable. But I digress. So this, from all sin, from all error, from all evil. And think of Luther writing this in, in his time, from all error. There were errors in the Roman Catholic Church at the time. Deliver us from this, from the crafts and assaults of the devil, from sudden and evil death. Uh, a death unprepared for. A death not... I guess, prepared for, uh, that that God would deliver us from a death that catches us off guard insofar as our faith, that we are not faithfully prepared to, to meet the Lord. Spare us from that, good Lord, from pestilence and famine, from war and bloodshed, from sedition and from rebellion. There was a lot of bloodshed during the time of the Reformation, especially with the Peasants' War, and that is something uh, worth talking about later. But all of these things, Lord, good Lord, The only good Lord. To admit that God is good is to admit that he is God because he is the only good. And so we say, good Lord, deliver us. Then we get to this beautiful petition. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, by your baptism, fasting, and temptation, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, Help us, good Lord. So when we pray from sin, from evil, from error, from the crafts and assaults of the devil, from sudden and evil death, from pestilence and famine, from war and bloodshed, deliver us, good Lord. How does he do this? Well, this petition, as we make it, also answers the question. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity. You see, your conception and your birth is sinful and needs to be redeemed by a holy birth. 
by your baptism, fasting and temptation. Jesus' baptism is what gives our baptism its power. Your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. So it is important for the Christian to understand that it is the entire life of Christ that is the work that he has done to redeem us. It's not just that Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and Easter Sunday. It is from the moment of his conception, he is stepping down from his throne to redeem mankind, redeeming our sinful conception with his holy conception, redeeming our sinful birth with his holy birth, being baptized in... I don't want to say a reverse baptism in in which our baptism, all of our sins are washed away, where Jesus is washed into our sins. I don't want to make that statement, but it is his baptism that gives validity to our baptism, that his baptism sanctifies all water and makes all water a lavish washing of regeneration and renewal in the Holy Spirit. And of course, his fasting, his temptation, his enduring temptation and fighting back with the word of God that redeems our enduring of temptation and our unwillingness to sacrifice of ourselves for a greater good. And of course, his agony and bloody sweat, his cross and passion, his precious death, his death undeserved that replaces ours, which is, and his resurrection which unites us to him and his ascension into heaven where he goes to be seated, seated. Everything is done at the right hand of the Father and to, to intercede for us. That still, that continuous prayer, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And of course, his sending of the Holy Spirit who calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth. This is how Jesus delivers us from sin, death, and the power of the devil. This is what Jesus has done to answer every single prayer and petition and beseeching of him for mercy. In all time of our tribulation, in all time of our prosperity, in the hour of death and on the day of judgment. Isn't that interesting? That in tribulation and prosperity, again, this is a prayer that embraces the concept of suffering as Christianity embraces the concept of suffering. We poor sinners implore you to hear us, O Lord to rule and govern your holy Christian church, to preserve all pastors and ministers of your church in the true knowledge and understanding of your wholesome word and to sustain them in holy living. And this prayer just goes on. To put an end to all schism, again, interesting that Luther would write that, and cause of offense, to bring into the way of truth all who have erred and are deceived, to beat down Satan under our feet, to send faithful laborers into your harvest and to accompany your word, With your grace and spirit, we implore you to hear us, good Lord, to raise those who fall and strengthen those who stand and to comfort and help the weak-hearted and the distressed. And then, of course, petitions for kind of the local things, for our country, for our government, for our leaders, for for our neighbor around us, for women and children, these petitions. To forgive our enemies, persecutors and slanderers, and to turn their hearts. To give and preserve for our use the kindly fruits of the earth earth, and graciously to hear our prayer. Isn't that interesting? To forgive our enemies, persecutors and slanderers, and to turn their hearts. I I can't think of a prayer that would, would embrace suffering in any other way than that we should endure asking God, forgive them. Forgive the one who has done wrong to me. More than that, Lord, turn their heart, that they may no longer be an enemy, but likewise be a redeemed child of yours. And then the prayer concludes, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we implore you to hear us. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Amen. And of course, then you can conclude, if you so choose, with the Lord's Prayer. What a lovely prayer. And I really didn't do it justice in this. Uh, But again, links 
the text in the co in the description below link to it being chanted in in the in the bleh, I can talk in the description below if you're looking maybe you're not ready to fast yet maybe you're not ready to give up a meal or two or or to deprive yourself of something that you love um like i don't know coffee or something like that uh to to uh, to heighten your your dependence on god if you're not ready to give something up then you are free on this ash wednesday to engage yourself in something and i would highly encourage you if you have nothing yet to engage yourself in the litany to pray this ancient prayer of the church every day for the season of Lent. It's a beautiful prayer. It's a wonderful prayer. It's and when it's chanted, it's just so much the better. So if you're looking for something to do this Lent, I would recommend the litany. If you're looking for a prayer to uh, increase your prayer life, I would recommend the litany. It is one of the greatest gifts that God has ever given to his church. And it, it stands in stark contrast to the way mainline American evangelicals are being taught to pray. And it brings us back into the way we are taught to pray, which is the style of the Lord's Prayer. This this really is a, a, a prayerful study on the Lord's Prayer itself. And it is a true blessing. And I really encourage you to at least pray it once and listen, listen to the sound of this, this ancient prayer being chanted. Because as the ancients have said, he who sings prays twice. I'm Ryan. And until next time, may God richly bless you and the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.